All right, everyone, welcome in on a Thursday night at 6 o'clock Eastern time. Yeah, you got to kind of dodge and weave to, to find us this week a little bit, but uh, we have delivered. Here we are Thursday night for Florida State Seminoles Talk with Jason Parker from Chop Chat on the line to help us break down Florida State. Just about two and a half weeks away, Jason. Just about two and a half weeks away, and, and next time if we're going to delay today, let, can you let me know in advance a little bit? I had to call in sick from work and whatnot. I've been sitting here in my chopchat.com shirt for, for 20, nearly 24 hours now just waiting, waiting for you, Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. You are one dedicated son of a gun. I tell you that, Jason. I am. I am. Jason I, joins I, us every week. Jason has not missed. It now is 12 consecutive shows for Jason. The question is going to be, when will I miss one? There is going to be one, but the question is, how far do we go? Do we go 20 weeks? Do we go through the season? Is Are we going to make it through the 2019 season? Yeah, we may need to start uh, some sort of a um, some sort of a pool on that. Okay. Uh, get everyone involved. When will Jason finally miss? That's a good question. Uh, I mentioned the Cal Ripken streak uh, a few months ago at 2632. So I think Jason needs to strive for 2632. I think we need to be 50 years down the line. And uh, Jason's still uh, without a miss. I'm going to go with no on that one, but but we'll, we'll be somewhere around there. Somewhere around there. All right, folks, here's the deal. We're just about 10 or 11 days away from football, Florida State style, as they take on Boise State and Jacksonville. And, of course, uh, a huge mystery wild card team, as I see it. Uh, this Florida State bunch is still talented, but, of course, has their areas of concerns, and it's going to be fascinating to see what happens with this offense with Kendall Bryles at the controls and James Blackman ready to go for a full season. Hopefully Alex Hornibrook waiting in the wings. We talk Florida state football here every Wednesday night. Please don't be confused. It's typically Wednesday night has every week, excluding I think we're 10 for 12 uh, Wednesday night at seven o'clock Eastern time this week. We come your way on Thursday night at six o'clock and hopefully um, you know that, hey, if you miss the show, you go back and you watch the replay. We've got all sorts of good stuff to talk about with Jason, and certainly we will be monitoring your comments before we take the deep dive on Florida State football. I want to remind you that you can help us build the channel by grabbing the Amazon link in the description section below. Do your regular shopping right there. Also, there it is. Just watch Jason, he he will point you in the right direction each and every time, not just concerning football, concerning promotions, everything involved. Jason can follow my lead like nobody else. As the Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. See that? It, it, it's just uncanny. It flows. It flows. So we also have a deal going with a number of YouTubers collaborating with St. Jude's Hospital and also Volunteer Roadshow and BetNow.eu. If you like to bet a few bucks on the games, please check out the link below next to the hashtag Sam Strong. It's for a worthy cause. Plus, you get 50% additional added to your account. If you're not real good with math, let's say you put 100 bucks in, you get 50 free bucks to gamble with. There you go. Uh, if you use the promo code MRTVCFB. And don't forget here at our normal Wednesday night discussion, you have myself and Logan Robinson from no game day. We've got to bet on next week's Florida Miami game. Loser, loser pays up. So, so come on, Miami, make Logan pay. Okay, so you've got the the Canes and he's got the Eaters, and right. there are no point spreads involved here. No, straight up just victory. So, so you I like need, Miami to win that game. I think yeah. I, I just have it. It smells like 2013. It just has a lot of that feel of 2013 all over again. All right, that is right on the line. But of course, the line is uh, favored. Uh, toward the Florida uh, side. Mark, All right, let's talk some Florida State football. You, you win no matter what, Mark. So. Monitor the comments here. What's that, Jason? I said you win no matter what, So because we're going to do it in the name of Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So you win no matter what. I can't what. lose. When you and Logan, you guys uh, throw out as many wagers against each other as possible. I will just uh, be amused. Jalen Parks mm -hmm. uh, in the 2017 recruiting class was the ninth rated defensive tackle in the nation, according to the 247 composite. So very highly regarded, touted coming out of high school. Unfortunately, uh, ankle injuries last year, uh, disqualified, retiring from football, Jason. Yeah, this one, you know, and, and we've talked about, you know, the, the defensive line. We've talked about guys like Marvin Wilson. Uh, 
uh, Joshua Kendo on the end and whatnot. This one does hurt a little bit. Um, I, like you said, he was uh, a top 10 defensive tackle for the uh, class of 2017, the last class under the uh, Jimbo Fisher era in Tallahassee. Um, this one hurts because of depth issues. And, and, and I, what you know, he redshirted in 2017. He didn't play a down in 2018 as he was dealing with the ankle injury. There was a lot of hope that he would be able to come back from that injury. So the fact that he was medically disqualified, he will still be able to uh, finish his degree from Florida State. He'll have two years left uh, to finish his degree. But this one does hurt as far as depth. So this is going to put a little bit more pressure on who will be the guys who who will who will step up with Marvin Wilson, with Kendo to take forth that to, to who wants to play, who wants to who wants uh, decent reps with the defensive line this season. Talking Florida State football each and every week, uh, typically Wednesday night at seven o'clock. We've got a well, we'll call it a special that that covers up any kind of scheduling mishaps or snafus or mistakes by me otherwise. Uh, so this would be a special edition of Florida State Seminoles Live here on a Thursday night at 6 o'clock. We also, Jason, as we tee you up for some more analysis of the Florida State news and notes, Jordan Travis, the wow. waiver has been approved, and I will let you uh, take that away as well. Thank you, God. Let's just let's just say that right there. And and, and let's, we'll go with the positive source on this one. So the positive aspect is, and, and Kyle asking the question, do you see him getting significant reps this season? I don't see him honestly playing it down this season uh, for Florida State. I think that you, if we are if we are putting betting odds on it right now, I think uh, James Blackman is the starter, and I think Alex Hornibrook is the number two guy right now. So I think the chances of seeing Jordan Travis playing at all this season are slim or none. What it does, and this is what FSU has been – has been has been fighting for when it comes to getting this waiver approved is depth and and we talked about it all season this is this is what FSU needs is now you have that that blanket in case in case god forbid something happens to black and something happens to horny Brook as a backup you just have that there so that's good right there and and i think it also alleviates a lot of the concerns that that some FSU fans had about the quarterback situation. There was a lot of talk once uh, Florida State lost their star uh, star commitment from the, the 2019 class to North Carolina, that Sam Howell, that it was going to be, you know, what, what's going on with the quarterback situation? Well, you ended up getting Jordan Travis, who's from South Florida. His brother played baseball for FSU. He spent one year at Louisville, and he transferred in. Uh, you had White Rector who transferred in from, uh, I believe it was Central Michigan, Western Michigan, one of the Michigans, one of the directional Michigans uh, he transferred in from. So you've got a little bit of depth, not just for this season, but also going on. Now for the negative part, and, and we've written about this on Shop Chat, and George, I'm going to get to you in a moment. <laughs> we've written about this on Shop Chat before. The NCAA essentially held Florida State, and they held Jordan Travis hostage throughout this whole thing. Jordan Travis transferred shortly after the 2018 season ended officially in, in December of 2018. So he had to wait nearly eight calendar months before his transfer was approved by the NCAA. Meanwhile, Justin Fields, who transferred from Georgia to Ohio State for understandable uh, reasons why he, he said he needed a transfer. You had Tate Martell, who's now going to probably be the third string quarterback in Miami. And we can talk about that as we go on. Cause that was really funny. He transferred and his was approved within, it seemed like eight days as opposed to Jordan Travis who had to wait eight months. Yes. FSU got what they wanted in the end. Should they have waited this long? Absolutely not. And, and I think it's disturbing that the NCAA made them wait this long before saying, okay, here you go. You, you you finally got what you wanted, but we're going to make you sweat it out a little bit. So, but that's the NCA, you know, and, and every school, every fan of every school is going to say it. Oh, they're against us. This is a clear sign that the NCA has something, something against Florida State. It's just another in the long line of 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 continuing things against Florida State. George, Florida State can't even win the ACC. They are the disgrace. Okay, disgrace is spelled incorrectly. Never mind, you're a Gator. Okay, of Florida football. More embarrassing than Miami. Okay, George. 
um, disgrace spelled incorrectly. And I, no one here has even said Florida State would win the ACC. So, but thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Thank you for listening. And thank you for watching, George. I'll be like Albert there. I'll hold up my, my thumb like that. You know, Jason, I think if we yeah. kept track, uh, the misspellings on the the comments that oh, I post God. is probably running about 82%. Oh, dear God. I, I've just seen I, I mean, the, the, the former English major in me just wants to, you know, critique a little bit, just take a red pen and just, you know, mark it down. But, but we'll let it go there. So we got uh, Jason Parker on the line from Chop Chat. So we encourage you to check out his work and the rest of the staff there on Fansided at the Florida State uh, Seminole subsite there. Again, it's chopchat.com for Florida State football coverage. As, uh, it's coming. It's coming fast. Yeah. Florida State and those Broncos of Boise State. And we will break down a matchup between the Broncos and the Knolls in just a few minutes. Uh, we covered the Jalen Parks news. Jordan Travis, we've got a slight injury update out of camp uh, where uh, the Knowles have been practicing out of IMG Academy. Defensive end Joshua Kando has a bit of a hammy. Uh, it's not anything too serious, but you know that those things can linger. Willie Taggart just making the comments that they're going to do everything possible to make sure that he's ready to roll on opening day, August 31st against Boise State. Any thoughts about uh, DN Kando and that positional group? Yeah, we've talked about it. Um, it's the second straight year that they've gone over to uh, IMG Academy over in Bradenton, just south of Tampa, near where uh, where uh, Willie Taggart grew up. Um, we've talked about this uh, at the beginning of camp. Marvin Wilson missed a little bit of time with uh, an injury and whatnot, and this is what goes back to uh, when we talk about Jalen Parks and him being uh, medically disqualified. It's the depth issue. It's the fact of, of you know, are you going to have the guys? And I, I do believe everyone will be healthy enough to to play against Boise State and to to play once the season goes. But it's just that concern right now of how will these guys be ready? Will these guys have had enough practice time? Will these guys be uh, be ready to go for Boise State? I think they will, but it's just the, that concern. It's that lingering concern in the back of your head. You know, you know, you know will Will Kando be one hundred percent, or is he going to be an eighty percent guy? Is Marvin Wilson going to be 100% or is he going to be a 75% guy? Now, ultimately, I'm of the of the 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 side of it that I would rather them take the time now so that they are 100% come Boise State game. Uh, but, you know, you're going to have those people who are concerned no matter what. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, bringing you Florida State talk each and every Wednesday night. And no, I'm not confused. It is Thursday night this week. So I appreciate all of you staying with us. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out of town, had some personal issues to deal with and uh, our guests were very much Jason in particular. We are also moving our Ohio state live stream, which is typically on Wednesday night. That's coming up tonight at nine o'clock Eastern time. So please join us for that. So thank you for being flexible. But next week we will be back on Wednesday, seven o'clock. Right I'm about 91% sure of that. Yeah. Sure. Yes, we will be back here on Wednesday night at seven o'clock yeah. Eastern time. A1 Otero, Jason, this guy gets it. I just want people to come on here, enjoy the college football talk, take part, enjoy, soak it in, engage, listen to what we have to say, provide their insight, their information, trash talk, do what they want to do. But guys like him get it. Mm -hmm. They at least say, you know, we need to give a little encouragement and a little boost to the YouTube and Google algorithm. Get the likes in there. It takes three seconds to like the video, like the live stream, and then move on and have a good time in the live chat. So guys like A1 Otero, thank you so much for the encouragement for everyone in the live chat to like the video. I think at the time, I'm guessing we had 37 on the line, which we are now at 64. So A1 Otero was looking for 37 likes. And, and, and it should be it. Let, let's get let's get the haters on. If you, if you got, I've seen we got a couple of Gator fans who've uh, who chimed in on their two cents. We usually get some Hurricane fans on there. Listen, we, we are all we are all about college football here. And, and once you guys realize that your schools are inferior to FSU, it'll be a lot better. But for right now, join on like Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football said, and, and then join on with us right here. I certainly didn't make it easy on you, uh, Jason, when, when, I, uh, when you took on that uh, promotional uh, task. Uh, that Mark Rogers TV voice of college football that has to be spit out each and every time. That's that's well done by you. 
I mean, I was sitting there. I saw somebody at work the other day who said their name was Mark, and I said Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, and it just came it just out. Just automatically oh. came out. Yeah, just it just comes like, out now. It looked at me like, what the hell's wrong with Phil? You know, it worked <laughs> out, so it's fine. Well, some people look at me kind of strange when I, that comes out of my mouth as well. I did the uh, first time. I'll admit it. I was like, what is? What did I sign up for? Absolutely. So we will also let everyone know that the super chat is on. You can make your contribution to the channel in so many different ways. That is one way in particular, the super chat audio. You can catch our audio podcast, which is basically the audio from any of the videos on all the major platforms. I won't run them down, but Google Play. Yes, I will. Google Play, Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. The Amazon link below to do your shopping. Again, the betnow.eu. I got too many promotions, Jason, but I just got to spit these out and let people know where we are because this is going to help sustain this. So if you love what we do here each and every day, uh, Florida State in particular, each and every Wednesday, but we talk Florida State football. And and for those of you that want to get set for the Florida State season in particular, and I'm guessing that's about 90% of you, yeah. check out the videos that Jason and I produced uh, two or three weeks ago where we broke down every position on the team. I'm sure Jason has a number of articles in similar fashion in regards to the breakdown of the personnel on the Knowles roster. Which leads us to, even though we're uh, got our laser focus on what's coming up here in 10 or 11 days, Jason, uh, it's always fun to speculate on what games, what matchups, what series may be contracted for the future. And uh, the speculation is concerning Florida State and Alabama. Now, a matchup between those two schools comes to mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, about that. See what had happened. Oh, um, so this weekend uh, there was a report that came out that Alabama, obviously, uh, head coach Nick Saban has been really pushing for them to schedule uh, ten Power Five opponents to make up uh, for those two cupcakes they usually play towards the end of the year before their uh, Auburn game. And one of the conversations came to a report that all Alabama and FSU are scheduled are in talks to schedule a game for an upcoming season. So, of course, the first thought in everyone's mind was having the PTSD of um, the 2017 season and, you know, what started the downhill slalom of, of Florida State football over the last two seasons from that point. Uh, but then the report came out that it was for starting the 2025 season, that that's when the talks were. And I wrote about the, this week on ShopChat.com how it's insane, how on paper it is insane to schedule a game right now using this FSU team with what Alabama has. This is an Alabama team that's won two of the last four national titles, was played in all four national title games. So on paper, it's crazy. In the future... I think it'd be necessary for FSU for a variety of reasons. Number one, FSU can't look like they are afraid of playing anyone. Yes, Alabama would be the obvious. Uh, uh, Clemson alum, stay on IMG. That's our minor league. Okay, good point, Clemson alum. Back to Alabama, though. Yeah, um, it's one of those things where FSU can't be afraid of anyone, and that's, that's how they built their program. When Bobby Bowden took over in the 1976 season and through the late 70s and the early 80s, it was play anyone, anywhere, at any time. And, and it built the program uh, to a level of respectability. That's what FSU needs to do right now. Would they still be the underdog at this point? Yes, but it's one of those things you can't be afraid to go out there and play. You know, they're used to playing in, in Atlanta of late. You, you played Alabama in 2017. They're supposed to open the 2020 season against West Virginia uh, in the Chick-fil-A bowl game, up, or preseason bowl game up there. So, you know, why not? You know, let's get another game. I'm a big proponent of playing – power programs and whatnot. So why not? Let's, let's, let's get Alabama on the schedule. Let's, let's just do it way down the line. Let, let's, 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 let maybe Nick Saban go back to the NFL, you know, something like that. Let's get him out. And again, if uh, they did it my way, these particular schools would be completely left out of it. Uh, there would be a committee that would use a metric that I've uh, outlined in other videos to make the scheduling square and fair and balanced uh, for everyone. L. I, Eric Gaddis. Yes, Jason. I get the need, though, and I will say this. I will actually defend the idea of playing some FCS schools because I do get it. You look at, for example, Florida State will be playing Alabama State this year on November 16th before the bye week and then the Florida game. That's a game that will, in many ways, help 
Alabama State and make their, their payroll this year will help out the program big time and whatnot. So I get it. These games are needed. So the idea that that FBS schools should not play FCS schools, I, I, I disagree with that. I think those games are needed. What is not needed, and I'm going to throw a rival under the bus there, is the University of Florida, for example, is playing two teams this season. Their, their non-conference slate is Miami and Florida State, and then I believe it is Townsend, and then uh, the other game is slipping my mind right now, but they are playing two teams from the FCS level this year. That's unnecessary. One game, I have no problem with. Two games, that is a serious problem. Coach Jason Parker on the line from Chop Chat. We encourage you to head over there and check out his work on Florida State football coverage as you try to get set uh, for 2019. Keep it locked in here as well. Uh, I'm always interested when people say so and so is a dark horse, mm -hmm. or they use these terms like so and so is a dark horse, or such and such team's going to surprise, or they're overrated, or they're underrated. Because I always want a barometer on what what are you, who's underrating whom, what's your measuring stick, a dark horse. Like I heard it mentioned this week that Virginia and Nebraska were dark horses to win their divisions. Well, no, the ACC media and the Big Ten media selected those teams to win their divisions. So that would not be a dark horse status to me. Uh, L. Eric Gaddis is mentioning just that Florida State is going to surprise some people this year. Uh, L. Eric Gaddis, if I'm getting your handle correct there, please let us know what you mean by that. So I'm going to ask Jason what a surprise would be to him. To me, a surprise with FSU would be, I think, if you want to use what would, what would a surprise be for FSU football in 2019, it would be having 10 wins. I think that it was, right now, I think you can guarantee, I guarantee it's a strong word. I think it was a strong possibility that Florida State is an eight-win team this season, eight, nine wins. I think that there's going to be uh, – the Clemson game, I think they they will lose. I don't think they're going to get blown out like last year, but I think they lose that one. And I think there's one or two more games along the way that they drop. I think if they were to be a 10-win team, if they are to to shock many people and be an 11-win team, finish 11-1, and one, you lose to Clemson, that to me is a surprise just based off what last year was. And I think that's why when people talk about FSU – and when they use the word surprise, when they use the word rebound, it's based off of the five and seven record last year. That, and we've talked about it before. That is not a five and seven team that was on the field. If you look at talent, if you look at the roster, but it was a five and seven team when the final record was said and done. So I think that's where you, people are using. And you look at the line. There's there's several Vegas lines that have the Boise State game that started as high as a touchdown. Now some have it at about three and a half points. So there's a lot of people giving more respect to Boise State. People put more money on Boise State. They think it's going to be a lot closer than it should be. I think it's going to be a 10, 14-point Florida State win uh, in that one. But I think that's where you're getting a lot. I think you're going to see a lot less people using the word surprise if Florida State can have a hot start. And we've talked about this. The, the barometer is going to be the first five games of the season. If Florida State goes into the Clemson game unbeaten at 5-0 and or 4-1, and the word surprise will not be used. If Florida State is a three and two team, let's say they lose to Virginia, lose to NC State, let's say they lose to Boise State and Virginia, one of some combination there, then the rest of the season of the word surprise will continue to be used. But I think it's just carrying over from solely the record of 2018. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. I, Jason, I let you off the hook that time, uh, bringing you a Florida State Seminoles live each and every week, typically on a Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. If you're joining us for a first time, this is typically not on Thursday, but uh, we had to make some adjustments this week. We've got uh, as many as 64 on the line, 62 right now. So we appreciate the slight increases each and every week. We were in the 30s. We're in the 40s. We are pushing past to 60. I believe we topped 100 at some point last week. And what is typically the case is we get near the end of the live stream and we have more people on the line than we ever had before. So that's why I send out the notifications. And so what you need to do is subscribe. Therefore, you get the notifications. You know when we're coming on and you can jump on right when we start. But never fear. You jump on after the video posts and you can watch the whole thing. I think I bashed Miami a little bit and that's when the numbers went up. So if you want to you know, throw me a from a softball towards the end here, we can, we can work that out. I am all for anything controversial within, uh, I guess, certain guidelines okay. that uh, would keep me, uh, uh, you know, still, still. Uh, I get it. I get still, it. Still, still, um, 
relevant and, st and still uh, in operation here on YouTube, but also would uh, tend us to, to to go viral would be would be tremendous. Uh, so I want to encourage everyone out there, just don't be selfish and take it in each and every week yourself, but go out there in social media and let people know that we're here each and every Wednesday night talking Florida State football. We got Miami typically. So the Wednesday night lineup is Florida State at 7 Eastern, Miami at 8, Ohio State at 9. We've got the Buckeyes coming up here at 9 o'clock tonight on a Thursday night. Uh, Jason, I heard some comments after practice from Willie Taggart uh, just in the last day or two commenting on the offensive line. And I was trying to read between the lines to determine whether he really believed in these comments or was just mm. trying to talk up the offensive line. Uh, coaches tend to do that. Too much praise given to a certain player or positional unit. Let's let's bring down the hype. Let's uh, temper it. Or I need to build these guys up. Let's let's build it up. And uh, certainly we don't have any game tape to go by at this point. So why not build them up? But he was pretty specific. Uh, it wasn't just they're getting better, they're coming together kind of thing. Very specific in talking about just being technically better as individuals, also more aggressive. He, he liked the aggression. He also liked the cohesion. After, after so, so for many of them, obviously, having gone through another spring, another set of individual workouts during the summer, and now another fall camp, the cohesion being much better. Uh, do you buy it? I buy that it's going to be a better unit than the last than the last probably three seasons, and I do believe Coach Tiger does honestly believe that. You look at the video, you look at what what Randy Clements has done so far. I mean, he's been there now a couple months, and he has he has basically revamped that offensive line and the structure into a, yes, a more tougher unit, a more physical uh, unit that you will see. I'm not willing to say that they are going to be. Um, you know, the best offensive line in college football, but they are definitely going to be much better. And I, I do think some of it is a hype job by, by Coach Taggart because I think the offensive line was so bad, you do have to build them up. But I do believe that he believes a decent amount of what he's saying, maybe not to the extent, but I do believe that he, he does believe it's going to be a better group. And I think it will be a better group. And I think they have played more physical uh, so far during practice. And I think our big thing is going to be this Saturday, when FSU has their their scrimmage, uh, you know, two weeks before the Boise State game, I think this is going to be the chance where we're going to see can this unit, you know, I hate to say it like this, but can they block anyone to give Cam Akers a chance? Can they can they keep James Blackman on his feet, <laughs> you know, and and not be sacked thirty times in a season? That's the big thing uh, as far as the offensive line is going to be concerned. If, if they can keep you know, most of the uniforms as clean as possible against Boise State, that's when I think you're going to see a big sigh of relief from the fan base and from those who cover FSU football. So this could be a potential concern looking at week one when we see a weakness for Florida State mm -hmm. taking on what is expected to be a strength for Boise State. An interesting dichotomy here for Boise State is that they lose their defensive coordinator from last year, Andy Avalos. He goes to Oregon. They lose all three unit coaches, defensive line, linebackers, and secondary from a very good defense that uh, went 11-3, and three, uh, won a bowl game. Very good team from last year. Actually, they played Boston College. That's right. That was the cancellation yeah. of that bowl game. So anyway, 11-2 and two last year and a very good football team once again. They bring back two tackles inside that have 46 career starts, one of them racking up eight and a half tackles for loss, eight and a half sacks a couple of years ago. They have nine starters who start have started at least a nine games in their career. If you go to the second level, they've got a junior in Curtis Weaver who already has 20 and a half career sacks. He's already sixth on the school's all-time sack. Uh, list. Uh, they've got a 3-4 defense that they're installing. So they, they've they got experienced personnel, but not that they're not good coaches, but there's always a, a learning curve in regards to getting comfortable with the individual position coaches, their terminology, a different defense that they're going to have to learn and are in the process of learning. So the, the front seven for Boise State is extremely experienced and has some guys that we may actually see play on Sunday. If FSU is going to win this opener, it's going to be on the strength of the passing game because the running the the, the running game. You look their their rush defense last year. They finished in the top, I believe it was fifty seventh in total defense last year in college football. 
but they finished top 30 against the run, and I believe it was 92 or 93 against the pass. So it's going to be if James Blackman's the starter, which, you know, let's oh, let's say James Blackman's going to be the starter. James Blackman's going to need a 300-yard game. He's going to need three or four touchdowns in this game. He's going to have to be the one to take advantage of it if FSU is going to get a convincing win. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that Cam Akers in the running game uh, and whatnot can't do anything at all, but, you know, let's just let's call it what it is. The last three years have, have pretty much said that it's going to be the passing game that's going to win anything for FSU. So I think that's the big thing. Um, as far as losing coaches, to me, I'm not as much sold on that being, you know, a huge problem for Boise State. I'm going to give them a little bit of credit. Boise State, and, and I've said this before, can Boise State come into Jacksonville and beat FSU? Absolutely, 100%. I would not be, I would be, you know, disappointed as a as a FSU grad and somebody who paid a lot of money to go to that game in two weeks. But do I think they could lose that game? Absolutely. I also think that Boise State, you know, they're a tough team. They're one of those consistent teams. But I think it's going to be more on the players, and I think that's the thing. You lose guys who who have built that program over the last couple of years, you're going to be replacing them. That's going to be the big issue. So to me, replacing some of the guys they've lost off that front is going to be the big thing that FSU is going to have to take advantage of. But I do think that if FSU wins this game, it's going to be on the strength of, you know, just assuming he's a starter of James Blackman's quarterback. Uh, Ramon Jordan, we appreciate the contribution to the channel. Thank you so much for the yeah. encouragement as you uh, typically pass along, Ramon. Thank you so much. Uh, looking for any comments or questions that you guys have. A lot of Clemson talk, a lot of Miami talk in the live chat, as well as uh, Florida State as well. Cornelius Walker, 10 and 2, would be a surprise. We got Mike Myrick, who's a faithful, faithful viewer of Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Mike, thank you so much for joining us again tonight. He likes 10 and two this year. My, and, question, uh, my question would be to them, and if they want to write, who would be the two losses? I think, you know, even the, the biggest diehard FSU fan would say right now on paper, Clemson is probably one loss. But who, if you're 10 and two, who is the other loss to? Who's the only other team that right now FSU loses to? I think most people would probably say Florida, but is it one of those things where they can beat Florida and Miami? and they lose a game they shouldn't lose to, to a Boston college, to an NC State, you know, hell, to a Wake Forest the week after Clemson. You know, we wrote about this this week. Those are the three games that are probably schedule-wise the most difficult. Sean Nicholson is asking, wait, Mark, what is Willie Taggart's best record as a head coach? Off the top of my head, I believe he had an 11-2 year at South Florida. Yeah, I believe yeah, it was either 10 wins or 11 wins. So, yeah, but, but remember, he's not that great, right? Okay. It was one season. It was one. That was one. So, so it was five and seven. Five and seven was, five one. And seven was one season. Uh, what's interesting about the division uh, for me is that even though it's not a great division and certainly Louisville has taken a huge, huge step back. But yet you uh, still get their coach ahead of Willie Taggart, just throwing that out there. And I tend to, <laughs> well, he, he certainly um, has, has shown to be a winning head coach elsewhere at Appalachian State with three consecutive Sun Belt championships. So the the point I'm getting to is that when I look at the schedule, the Clemson game is the obvious loss, and then Miami's probably the second most talented team on the schedule within the ACC. Of course, Florida's at the end, uh, but there's you in the ACC. You've got that glut of seven slash eight win type teams that are really good teams. They're decent. They're capable. They're all going to be bowl teams. They have been for the last several seasons. And I'm speaking of NC State, Boston College, Wake Forest, now Syracuse, where they're all capable of winning. I don't think any of them are as talented as Florida State, but the, it would not be any shock if any of them beat Florida State as they have uh, some of them the past two seasons. Well, and we've talked about this, and I've written this before several times on Chop Chat. FSU has a, a tradition, if you will, of playing down to the level of their competition. You look, you know, the 2015 Georgia Tech game, the, 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 the blocked return for a touchdown to beat them. And that was a Georgia Tech team that finished the year three and nine. Florida State had no business losing to that team. Florida State had no business losing to Virginia in 2011 in the, the home finale that season. The, you know, Florida State had no, oh, Draco, I'm going to get on you in a moment. Uh, <laughs> 
there's, you know, the NC State game in 2012. So Florida State has a tradition. So I, you know, and we can talk about this, you know, as it goes on, but I think Florida State finishes eight or nine wins. I think it's going to be one of those things where I think they beat Florida because I think Florida's going to be a, 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 a beaten team by the end of the season. I think they beat Miami. So it's going to be one of those things. Do they lose to, you know, just like we said off the top of the head, do they lose to NC State? Do they lose to a Boston College team after, you know, playing Clemson, playing Syracuse, and playing Miami? You know, what happens at that at that point? You know, are they, are they going to let their guard down? It, you know, if let's say it happens and all the Clemson people will be upset, but what happens if FSU upsets Clemson and they're riding high the following week into a decent Wake Forest team that they needed a Hail Mary to beat the last time they played in Winston-Salem? Can that Wake Forest team win the game? So it's going to be one of those things where can FSU avoid playing down to the level of their competition and which teams are going to take advantage of that? Draco, Boise State beats Florida State easily. Easily. What? What? I would love to know what that what that means, sir. What? What? What does that mean? See, that's another term, Jason. Yeah. I kind of alluded to that with the dark horses, the overrated, the underrated. What's easily? Some people you'll see like a twenty-seven to seventeen game, and they'll say, "Oh, so and so killed them." Oh, did they really? I thought that was a really good game. It was like twenty to seventeen. Then they tacked down a TD with three minutes. Yeah. It was twenty-seven to seventeen. They killed them. Uh, so everybody has their different. Uh, uh, context for what an easy win is, I, I would like to know how I, that's going to be displayed. Yes, I, I think that will go back to you know, I'll give an example. You know, and, and uh, picked on Florida earlier. I'll pick on Miami. Miami beat FSU by one point last year, and all I've heard from Miami fans, oh, we killed Miami, we killed Florida State, we killed Florida State. We were up by twenty points late in, in the second half, and, and yeah, you came back to win. By a point, you didn't. You beat us. You didn't kill us. So I think I think there's also a level of the fact that FSU, on paper, is supposed to beat Boise State. So for for the Boise State faction, any win, a three point win, a seven point win, is going to be winning easily. It's going to be a considerable win because of the all the preseason hype. Every time to trips ninety percent off. Oh, Captain Trips, you're funny. Oh, you're hilarious. Get a new hat, Chief. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, bringing you expert analysis, discussion, debate, and discussion. Yes, discussion, debate, analysis. Those are the three I usually throw out better than anyone wow. online with the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the nation. And, of course, analysis from myself. I have taken on the contenders in the ACC, the Big Ten, and the SEC and posted those videos with my thoughts. Uh, pretty extensive personnel breakdowns for 15 to 20 minutes on the likes of Penn State, Michigan State, Michigan, five teams in the ACC, all the contenders, Virginia, Virginia Tech, Miami, Florida State, Clemson, et cetera, on through the SEC. I probably am not going to make it through the other two, but you see the 120 to 150 videos posted each month. And of course, the live streams here with Florida State, Miami, and Ohio State, typically on a Wednesday night. We'll be back with the Buckeyes at nine o'clock Eastern time tonight. And of course, do your Amazon shopping using the link below. Can I point out that we mocked you a little bit when you got your countdown clock, when the when the dedicated fan watched the countdown clock? But notice, look under the days. We are under ten days until college football season. Saints be praised, all hope alive. We are under ten days. I don't know how we're going to keep these shows at fifty or fifty-five minutes once we have games to talk about. Once we have games to review and games the next Saturday to look ahead to and preview. We need a mute button. You need to mute us. Sometimes, like like um, like they do on ESPN on around the horn. Just well, that's a whole other matter. Needing to mute you at times. That hurt a little bit. That hurt right here. Just a little bit. Right, right under the H and the O and shop. It really. Uh, but yet we bring you back. <laughs> we appreciate it, Jason. Uh, so we've got the super chat on. So if you understand what we're doing here with seventy on the line uh, again, uh, I think many of you and I appreciate your foresight, your vision, you understand what we're trying to build here in delivering as good a football analysis at the collegiate level that you're going to find anywhere. And it could be so much better as we uh, build this out. We also appreciate the contributions of Jason coming on here each and every week, 12 consecutive weeks and still going strong. Next week, 13, lucky number 13, Dan Marino. Dan Marino number right there. Not a Rob number. Absolutely. Five. Or Davy Concepcion, if you want to go way, way back. I'm a South Florida guy, so I'm going to stick with, with Dan Marino, greatest quarterback to never win a Super Bowl. So. 
Absolutely, he is. I can't think of anybody that's in that discussion beyond him. Uh, maybe you drop down to Fran Tarkington after Dan Marino would be the next guy I would think of. Well, my argument there would be Fran, Fran Tarkington at least had some semblance of a running game. Dan Marino had no running game. I mean, his last decent running back was probably Sammy Smith. Yeah, that's a little FSU bias there, but who did he have? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? John Avery? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, John Avery from uh, Old Miss, yeah. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, a UCLA product. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned Sammy Smith from FSU. Oh, that's yeah. probably about as good as he did. Ron Davenport at one point. Oh, God. Uh, of course, early in his career, Tony Nathan was more a yeah. pass-catching guy out of the backfield. Oh, God. Bad memories. Oh, PTSD of being a Dolphins fan in the 90s. Oh, come on. And it looked early in his career that this would not be an issue. No. I mean, you. I mean, he's even said that. After the second Super Bowl, he thought, oh, I made it my second season. Oh, I'm going to make plenty of these. Oh, wait, never mind. So, folks, we've got uh, two more shows before Boise State heads to Jacksonville and takes on the Knolls to break down the matchup between Boise State and Florida State. So we looked at uh, the Knolls offensive line taking on that Boise State front. And if you're a geek like me and want to know who you're playing and some of that personnel, again, Curtis Weaver is a really good outside linebacker uh, with 20 and a half career sacks. We, we took note of him and Ezekiel Noah had 29 tackles for this Boise State team in their last four games. So he's come on as a breakout player for them after not playing much of the season. And they've got two D tackles in uh, Louie and Moa. I will not pronounce their first names because I don't have them in front of me is one reason why with 46 career starts. So it's going to be interesting to see a stout group of five. So that's to put it into context group of five. So we're not talking about them achieving those type of numbers against a big 10 schedule, for example, but a really solid top end elite group of five front seven and D tackles in particular, taking on guys that were recruited at a much higher level, but have struggled over the past several seasons. And 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 once again, let's give Boise State some credit. I mean, you look at their schedule last season, you know, in their in their games, they lost two regular season games where they got blown out by Oklahoma State on the road. And then they lost by one possession by six points to San Diego State. And then they lose in overtime in the Mount West Conference Championship game. I mean, they're they this is a decent ball club. Yes, they they lose Brett Rippin, their quarterback. He's not going to be obviously with the team, but this is a decent team, and this is a team that FSU does legitimately need to watch out for. John Deere giving you a shout out for your knowledge of Miami Dolphins football. John Deere, I would tell you that before probably three to four to five years ago when I got extremely um, serious about this, and and I don't want to discount in any way, so don't get this wrong, that I have been in love with college football since I was eight years old. So don't get this wrong. But now I just watch the NFL casually on Sunday afternoon with no investment of, I really need to know this. I really need to know Jacksonville's front seven with that type of mentality. I just watch the games. I love the NFL. I just soak it in, just watch the games. But at one point I had the same mentality toward the NFL that I do here, probably knew more about the NFL than I did about college football for most of my life. And at one point could recite the score of every NFL postseason game in the history of the league. Wow, that's a little scary. But you it, know it, it is scary. I'm not bragging about that. I, I'm just letting you know what a knucklehead I was. Hey by the way, shout out to the Jaguars for getting shut out last week by my Baltimore Ravens in the preseason opener. Let's give a shout out to them. Ravens you take root for the Ravens? Yes I do. I root for the Ravens. I gave up on the Dolphins after they drafted their offensive lineman in the first round for about the twelfth straight year. So I had to pick a team. I like the color purple. Yeah, that's nice. Nice color. Mr. Sports Authority here. Uh, that's the wrong comment. Uh, blah, 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 blah. He tricked me there. Let me catch up with the comment I'm looking for. There it is. Why do you talk about Florida State so much? Oh, um, let's see. Uh, parents went to school there. Dad was on the football team. Uh, let's see. I graduated from there. I get paid to write about it. So, yeah, just a few, few minor reasons. I, I don't know where that is directed toward. Maybe it's toward this show. Uh, you might want to check out the title, Florida State Seminoles Live. You know uh, what? You know what, though? But, but let's give him justice here. Let's let's get the Iowa State Cyclones 
football schedule. Let's rank it up this year real quick. So they start off with Northern Iowa. What do you think about that game? I think it better be a win. I hope so. Then they go. Then they play Iowa, obviously, for the Cyhawk Trophy. Then they got Louisiana Monroe two weeks after FSU plays Louisiana Monroe. So they'll be – there you go. You, sir, Mr. Mr. Sports Authority, should watch this so that we can break down Louisiana Monroe for your Cyclones. So I provided my thoughts on Iowa State football around Big 12 media time. So please check out that video, Sports Authority. And I will be, of course, predicting the Iowa State football games and the season just like anybody else. And believe me, if Iowa State will bring in, if I had the time, if I was doing this full time and I did three shows, let's see, like five or six days a week, I could get in 15 to 18 teams. Iowa State may uh, squeeze in there. But uh, I'm doubting at this point that my judgment would include Iowa State uh, to to uh, bring in the type of uh, viewership we would need to justify a live stream. It was between Iowa State and UCF, and you decided to go with the Knights, right? Mm. No? Yes, sure. You're the one. Okay. Iowa State. So my issue, Jason, with Iowa scheduling and Iowa State scheduling is they play in leagues that have nine conference games in the Big Ten and the Big 12. So that only leaves them three spots to schedule nine conference games. They always play each other, which I think is great. But this is the issue. Neither one of them typically, and, and this pretty much holds true across the, the board. Iowa had a home and home with Pitt a few years ago. But besides that, you have to go back forever to find Iowa State and Iowa playing other Power 5 teams. Therefore, it's the most boring schedule in college football, so the fans don't even have to wait to see who they've contracted to play because they always know, well, we're going to play each other, and we're going to play no one else. Well, what I've always thought is you should do, and this is just a, a weird, crazy idea that I may have written after a, a couple of couple glasses of Jack Daniels one time, was that you should do like the NFL does, how you have uh, the the AFC East was used, for example, this year. I believe they are playing the NFC East. And then next year they'll play the NFC Central, the NFC West. You do it like that. You have it where every team, if you're going to have a 12-game schedule, which is too many games, it should have been an 11-game schedule, you cut down the number of bowl games, you cut down only six and six teams getting to go to the postseason and whatnot. Although FSU would have been in that position last year and I would have changed my position completely based on how my Seminoles would have done. But you have it where you have an eight-game conference slate. So you have your four non-conference games. You have your one game that you get to decide every single year. So in Florida State's case, it would be playing Florida every single year. And then you have, for example, this year the ACC plays the Big Ten. Then the next year the ACC plays the Big 12. Then the ACC plays the Pac-12, and so on and so forth. And you go down the line so that you have a, a year, for example, where Florida State's playing for the first time ever Washington. They, those two teams never played. You have, you know, using down here, you have Miami playing, you know, Southern Cal or Miami playing a Michigan, you know, all these teams. And you have more of these these decent games, these decent non-conference games. So that instead of it just being Florida State playing Louisiana Monroe or Miami playing uh, bethune Cookman or, or Toledo or whatnot. So I'm going to address uh, the comment made by Cubs fan 17 and the question here, and I appreciate it. Will you do a breakdown of games every Saturday? And thank you so much for the contribution right there. Uh, so Cubs fan 17, I'm guessing you were not around for last college football season. Believe me, <laughs> I am uh, working tirelessly to bring as many breakdowns on as many games as I possibly can for one individual. So believe me, it's like, live streams on Sunday recapping the games. It's like live streams on Wednesday night, all night from seven o'clock past 11 o'clock Eastern time. It's live streams on Thursday and Friday night with the games going on. It's live streams coming on, you know, after the noon games, the three 30 games, the seven o'clock games, the late night games. So we break down as many games with instant analysis and previews as we can possibly, possibly get to. First of all, I don't think there's a certain amount of people in both the FSU base and the all fan bases who don't understand how hard it is, what you do and what it is to work. You know, it, it is work to go, and people say all the time, oh, you get paid to go to, to football games. It's it's a lot of work to do what we do. But more importantly, Cubs fan, what's happening to you, buddy? You're tied with the Cardinals? Come on now. you got to win that division. So I am headed out the door to meet my daughter for dinner, but I would like uh, Jason to attack one question we have here. After I address very quickly, briefly, since Jason was on the 
topic of scheduling and how he would attack the scheduling, I want to let you know that I have posted videos on this before that better explains it, but I'm going, to ex I'm going to explain it if I can talk in 30 seconds. And this is basically how I would view the scheduling and how I would approach it. I would put together a committee and it would not, they would not be left to their leisure to determine schedules in whatever way. They would be restricted to a very tight framework that would that would force them to build a non-conference schedule for every team in the country that is a composite 500 record in those non-conference games. Meaning, let's say the ACC stepped it up to a nine-game schedule. Florida State would play three non-conference games. I would allow Florida State to go out and schedule an FCS or whatever team they wanted to. They would get to schedule one game. My committee would schedule two games. And the main criteria of those two games is that those two teams record in conference from the previous season in power five play had to add up to a 500 record. Therefore, everyone in the country is playing one cupcake and they are playing two teams that add up to a composite 500 schedule. So everyone in theory, now, of course, we can't project the future and how good teams are going to get or if they're going to be better or worse from the previous season. But in theory, everyone is playing an even non-conference schedule. I think you put a little too much math into that, a little too much figuring out. It, it, it can be done. I've done it. It, it, it could be done. And 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 I, I understand the people who, who lean towards that way. I... I don't oppose teams making their own schedule and whatnot. And, and listen, if your prerogative, if you're you know, using the University of Florida, if your prerogative is to schedule Miami and Florida State and then two FCS teams this season, if your prerogative is, is uh, and yes, Kyle, everyone does love cupcakes. Red Velvet, birthday coming up, just remember that one. Um, It's hard to say because I, you know, I, I get that there's people who want everyone to play tough schedule. There's everyone who wants FSU to play. He's from Oklahoma, whatever. And still, whatever. They beat us when we were bad. Twenty eight eighty twenty eight. You are a faithful viewer. Thank you so much. Yes, it oh. is spot on. You you can't fire holes into my scheduling I, uh, I, concept. I think there does need to be some form of a uniformity in how it's done. But I do think, for example, using your formula. If you're telling me Florida State isn't going to play Florida every year, I'm telling you right now, the Florida State fan base will, would be up in arms over that. You do play Florida every year. Well, Florida, went, Florida went five and three in the SEC last year. So let's say everybody's got to play the same number of conference games, number one. So let's say we up it to nine games for everyone. So let's say this is a couple of years down the road. Florida went six and three in the SEC last year. Yeah. We find you a three and six team to play to match up with and pair with Florida as your two power five opponents out of three non-conference games. Believe me, I've done it. It can be done. And everybody has an equal and balanced schedule. The issue I have with your scheduling formula that you just brought up with the, the Big Ten playing the ACC this year, next year it's going to be the ACC and the SEC, is that would be fun from a viewing standpoint to say, wow, it's week two and everybody in the Big Ten is playing everybody in the SEC and Ohio State's playing in Alabama, Penn State's playing tennis, whoever. Oh, these matchups are incredible. From a viewing and entertainment standpoint, that would be amazing. But we've got this system where we've got to evaluate and judge these teams at the end of the year. And all we would have is all these Big Ten teams played everybody in the SEC, but didn't play anybody else in the country. But you would also get games. My comeback to that would be using Florida State as an example. Let's say your Florida State played the Pac-12, for example. And let's say Florida State has a schedule that includes uh, Washington, Stanford, and Arizona in the non-conference slate to go along with Florida, just, you know, based on you do it, you, you can break up the, the conferences into, you know, the, the top, the break up into three divisions, good, bad, and ugly. And you have those three teams right there. Those are three teams Florida State has never played. I think it encourages more, more games, more first time games between teams who've never played before. Number one. And number two, let's be honest, you know, all you hear from coaches and all you hear from conferences is, Oh, these, you know, you know, attendance is down. People, schools are losing money and whatnot. You got to you got to do something to, to to sexy it up a little bit. You know, Florida State decides they're going to sell alcohol at certain areas in Doe Campbell next season. You've got to do whatever at this point. So I just think you have to do something to to up the sex appeal of college football. 
In 28.80.28, the other reason my uh, scheduling formula is spot on is that it would also address in-conference scheduling. So I'm going to use an example from about five years ago, but this, this holds true every year. This one just sticks in my head. This is when LSU was as good as Alabama generally. This is like the beginning of the decade. There was a season in which, of course, they play in the same division. So they're playing exactly the same schedule in division. They're playing the other five teams, plus they play each other. So those six out of eight conference games are exactly the same. So the difference is, who do you play in the other division? In this particular year, LSU played Georgia and Florida, who both went 7-1 and one the previous season. So they are playing two teams who went 14-2 and two the previous season in the SEC. Alabama was playing Kentucky and Tennessee, who went 1-7 and 1-7 and in, in the SEC. So they're playing two teams that went 2-14 and 14 composite the year before. So you have two exceptional programs who are most likely going to be vying for division championship, and you're giving one of them that much of an advantage to play two teams that went 14-2 and two versus two teams that went 2-14 and 14 from the previous season. That well, I, 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 and, and I'm going to give you. I'm going to let you and 2828. You guys can can go get dinner together and, and talk about how great your scheduling formula is. I, I I would say that I think the biggest problem to me is the fact you've got and non conference wise, and we can talk about conference as we go on and on. But scheduling schedules so far in advance. You've got Florida State scheduling their series with Georgia in 2027, 2028. On paper, yeah, it looks like a great from the Florida State side, yeah, you're scheduling Georgia, a team that played for the national title two seasons ago, a team that's that's uh, that could play for it this year. For all we know, Georgia could be hot garbage in 2027, 2028. So I figure like you you schedule all these series so far in advance that that you never know what's going to happen. So smash right. the like button, 904 Hurricanes. Smash yes, please do that. And I apologize apologize to like i'm trying to talk and run out the door to five guys to meet my daughter at the same time as what i'm doing so it's affecting my mouth i think so uh yeah i got three minutes to do that it's an it's like an eight to ten minute drive so i really need to go but i uh i thank everybody out there uh that uh participated in the live chat uh, there are a ton of great comments and suggestions and and questions that we cannot get to obviously i can only put so many uh comments online Jason, thank you so much for bailing me out, being here to discuss Florida State football. It's always a good time. And again, folks, so please bring in your uh, family and friends and your social media acquaintances to talk Florida State football with us each and every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Eastern time. All right, sir. See you next Wednesday. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, bud. Thanks, everyone.